All right, let's get started. Welcome to CS 2050. The topic of today is just more pigeonhole. We're not done. Actually, the topic of today is not more pigeonhole. It's the generalized pigeonhole principle. We're actually not going to do the generalized pigeonhole principle yet. We're going to uh, do some more pigeonhole problems. We'll generalize the pigeonhole principle, and then we'll do some generalized pigeonhole principle problems. Um, so what does the pigeonhole principle state? Again, you have, if you have n pigeons and k holes, if n is greater than equal, greater than k, not greater than equal, but greater than k, then some uh, hole has more than one, like two or more pigeons. We showed kind of a diverse application of the pigeonhole principle. Again, every mathematical theorem you know, it's an item in your toolkit. You equip it to your status bar. It's going to give you certain magical powers when you call upon it. The pigeonhole principle is one that wills into existence certain objects non-constructively that have certain properties. It doesn't tell you where those objects are, what they look like, but only the, by the fact, by a simple counting argument, must they exist. So you will into existence these objects. Let's, we did some applications of the pigeonhole principle to sequences and number theory. Uh, let's do some applications of it to some like, I, what I, I don't know if I would call these geometry problems, but they're kind of interesting problems, right? So suppose you have, uh, consider a two by two square. If you place five points in this square, there exists two, a pair of points that are no more than square root of 2 apart. Again, what does this say? that no matter how you place the points, no matter what algorithms you use to place the points randomly, you know, whatever understanding of stochastics you have, you will into existence that no matter how you can possibly place these points, two of the points must be no farther apart than square root of two. The distance between the two points is square root of two. Does anyone have an idea how to first approach the problem? You shouldn't because you haven't seen this yet, but I'm just curious if anyone would be able to figure this out in a second. Yes? There has to be two points that are in the same quadrant, and the maximum QED. distance in the quadrant is square root. Two. Excellent, excellent. Take the square, the 2 by 2 square, uh, quadranted it, cut it into four pieces, place the five dots in the square, uh, by the pigeonhole principle, some quadrant has, there are five dots, four quadrants. By the pigeonhole principle, some quadrant has greater than or equal to two dots. Now, what is the maximum distance that these two could be apart is the hypotenuse of that square, right? The hypotenuse of the square of side lengths one is going to be the max distance they could be is uh, the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared by the Pythagorean theorem. 1 squared plus 1 squared is equal to the square root of 2. Again, kind of an interesting problem. Like, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't, again, say anything about distribution or randomness. You know, a physicist might, might approach a problem like this and try to take a limit of the number of points as any bridges infinity, and do some weird stochastic random not, randomness arguments or something, you know. But we don't need any of that. Uh, we can simply assert that there is a pair of points that are close together. Again, we will these points into existence by the pigeonhole principle. They must be close, you know. It could be the case that all five points are in the same quadrant. It could be the case, you could have something like this. This could be possible, right? 
those could be the five points. And then certainly the original principle is two, true. But if you were to push the points so far apart and try to make sure that none of them are close together, there's too many points. It's, it must be the case that two of the points are within square root of two of each other, no matter how you place the points, right? Questions on this one? In fact, this argument generalizes quite well. Uh, if you place uh, 101 points in a 6 by 8 rectangle, uh, there exists a pair of points uh, of distance less than or equal to 1 from each other. So we have a 6 by 8 rectangle. We're going, and now we have a lot more points. We have 101 points. How many smaller pieces should we cut our rectangle into? Forty? Forty-eight? Six by eight is forty-eight one by one squares. But if you place a point in a one by one square, it will be square root of two apart from each other. It is true that every, it is actually true, that is a perfect proof. If you break the six by eight rectangle into forty-eight one by one squares, you can prove that there exists a pair of points that are no greater than one unit apart from each other. However, the theorem that we're trying to prove is stronger. Not only does there exist a pair of points that are no greater than square root of 2 apart from each other, which is 1.4 or something, but there exists a pair of points that are no greater than 1 apart from each other. So let's prove a little something a little stronger. That would work and exactly. Here's, the, here's sort of the hint. You want your pigeons to just be like 1 greater than possible. So it's exactly like, in a worst case, like enough for you to flow over. So if you have 101 pigeons, how many holes should you want? 100. How do you break a 6 by 8 rectangle into 100 pieces? Is it uh, 36 consecutive? Sorry, what? Um, 36, uh, 1, 1, and 6. 36 and 64 pieces. Well, we want to break it into exactly 100 pieces. The area is 48. That's correct. Here's the here's maybe I, I, to get a little closer. It's okay that you don't break them into squares. We can break the rectangle into smaller rectangles. So, let's cut the sides. What should we cut the sides by? If we want to break it into 100 pieces, what should we cut them by? 10. 10. If we cut this by 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. OK, we cut that side by 10. 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 5, 5. OK, there we go. We broke the whole thing into 10. 10 by 10. So we broke it into 100 by 100 rectangles. OK? Something like that. The whole 6 by 8 square is broken up into 100 rectangles. What is the size of each rectangle? Six by eight. Yes. Break the 6 by 8 rectangle into 100 0 0.6 by 0 0.8 uh, rectangles. Uh, by the pigeonhole principle some rectangle must contain greater than or equal to two points. These points can be at most the hypotenuse apart.
So if we zoom that in, we're going to get this kind of rectangle here. This is going to be 0 0.6. This is going to be 0 0.8. The farthest the points could possibly be is the hypotenuse apart, no matter where you place the points. The farthest distance inside of this 0 0.6 by 0 0.8 rectangle must be uh, this hypotenuse, right? The, that's the longest distance that you can fit in the rectangle. Um, what is the length of the hypotenuse? One. Now, I'm not one for doing decimals, but I'll do fractions. 3 over 5 squared plus 4 over 5 squared. Squared root is going to be, what is 3 squared plus 4 squared? Yeah. QED. Right. You could perhaps take this problem and generalize it. You could, if I could give you a square, you could, like, what, what, how does this problem generalize? Well, you have to break it, hopefully, into even-sized pieces. If you broke it into weird pieces, you would have to choose the max distance in the biggest piece, something like this. Um, you would, uh, maybe if you were to cut a circle into, into pizza slices, you could do something. You know, there's all kinds of different variations of this. And again, this is a problem about, that doesn't on its surface appear to be about discrete mathematics. The plane, the coordinate, if we were to assign coordinate points to each point, like numbers, they're not necessarily at integer values. The, the, the points can be at real values. So in some sense, this is a problem about, uh, this is a problem about, uh, this is an application of discrete mathematics to the continuous, you know, to the to calculus and things like this, um, the way this applies. Discrete mathematics does not just tell you things about discrete objects in nature, but it can tell you a lot more. You just have to frame the question in a way that it makes you apply discrete mathematics. This is, again, one of those problems. In the spirit of applying discrete mathematics to the, conti the continuum, let me give you another example of a coloring. But does anyone mean uh, uh, example of a coloring in a second? Any questions on this problem, though? We understand again, uh, make sure you understand where the pigeonhole argument comes from. We had 100 pigeons, 101 pigeons, 100 holes. So when we break, when we map the pigeons into the pigeon holes, some pigeon hole has two pigeons. That's where it comes from. Consider the Cartesian plane. Cartesian plane is this huge, uncountable set R squared, right? R times R. The Cartesian plane is what you've ever plotted a graph on. If you plot the sine curve or whatever, you know. That might, maybe that's not the sine. Maybe, no, actually, that one might be cosine. Whatever. You know, consider the Cartesian plane. Huge, not a discrete object, OK? You have definitions of continuity in here. You have limits of functions. You can do all kinds of crazy things. If you color every point either red or blue, every single point, every single point you color red or blue, not like in some evenly spaced manner where there's space between the colored points, but every single point, every coordinate value that can possibly assign into this infinite set, color every single point either red or blue. For every distance a d greater than 0, there exists two points of the same color exactly d apart. Let's, again, interpret the theorem before we apply the pigeonhole principle. This is kind of an insane statement, right? If you color the entire square, the entire real plane, no matter how you do it, you can, for every distance, you can always find a pair of points that distance apart, which are that color, right? Let's suppose you color the whole thing red. Does there exist a pair of points for every distance that's red? Actually, OK, fine, that one's one. But let's suppose you try to adversarially color points. Suppose you take a sequence of points 
colored red, blue, red, blue as that converges to zero or something, right? Let's say you try to color splotches in a certain way such that you prevent distances being the same color. You know, you try a really big blue circle, and you just try like a red strip, and then you try a really big blue circle or again. It doesn't matter. No matter what way you color it, there exists a pair of points exactly d apart for, what it, for every d, every distance d, such that they have the same color. Again, this doesn't tell you which pair of points, how to find such a pair of points. We must apply the pigeonhole principle. We will will into existence these points. Does anyone have an idea how to start on this problem before we do it? It has a surprisingly elegant solution. Whenever you apply the pigeonhole principle, you should be thinking, what are my pigeons and what are my holes? What are our holes if we had to just start somewhere? To think out loud. The Cartesian plane would be our holes. But how many holes are there then? Infinitely? That's maybe not a good start. We want less holes than we have pigeons. Yeah. The, how many colors are there, though? Zero. So there's two colors. Our holes are going to be colors. So there's two possible colors. We need more than two pigeons to map to the two colors, right? So what do we know has three points? A triangle. Uh, embed an equilateral triangle. I just learned what that word is. Equilateral triangle of side lengths d into uh, our colored Cartesian plane. Perhaps you can see where the conclusion comes from now. Um, it has three points, but there are only two colors. So, uh, by the pigeonhole principle, two of its points are the same color. There are three points and two colors. So two of the points must be the same color. Those two points are exactly d apart, qed. Kind of one of those things that you see once and then you never forget it. This is such a, like, a lucid proof, you know. There's nothing about this, the sentence that has anything to do with triangles, you know. I mean, yet I am allowed to build a triangle because I need, I, I, need, I need enough pigeons to apply the pigeonhole principle. So I'm just going to make my own pigeons, you know. I'm making myself three pigeons, and I'm making sure these are exactly d apart, right? Because they're d apart, I don't know which pair of these three points is going to be. I don't even know where this triangle is placed. But no matter where it's placed, because we colored the entire Cartesian plane, each of these three points is assigned a color. Let's say this is red, and let's say this is blue, and this is blue, right? No matter how we color the, po the points of the triangle, two of the points must be the same color, because we have three points and two colors. You have three people and two colors. Two of the people are the same color, you know. So, whatever two points are the same color, either maybe all three points are red, maybe all three points are blue, maybe two of the points are blue, one of the points is red, whatever. No matter how you possibly color the points, one of the one of the pairs is exactly d apart. QED. Right. Perhaps you could generalize this as well. I won't do it. Uh, in the sake of time, but you could think about, okay, I color in three colors, and then I embed like a weird four-dimensional thing, you know, something like this. You can, you can generalize this argument, right? Any questions on this one? All right. If there are no more questions, we're finally done with the pigeonhole principle, and now let's get on to the generalized pigeonhole principle.
we can generalize the pigeonhole principle to say something stronger than the pigeonhole principle. The pigeonhole principle asserts that there is one pigeon, uh, there is one pigeonhole with a certain number of pigeons in it. But if we have way more pigeons than we have holes, we can actually uh, say something about the number of pigeons that must be in that hole. The generalized pigeonhole principle says, if you have n pigeons, k holes, and n is greater than k, then there, there is a hole, a wall, a hole, with how many pigeons in it? Not simply, let's try to generalize the pigeonhole principle. Not simply that there exists a hole with more than one pigeon in it, but let's suppose we had a thousand pigeons and three holes. What do we know that the small that that the pigeon hole with the most pigeons in it can have? Two, two, two to n. Two to the n. Two, two from two to n. Two to n. It could have possible values of two to n. Okay, but in fact, suppose a distribution of the pigeons in an, an adversarial way. What is the least amount of pigeons that the largest hole can have? Let's say that way. N over k rounded up. N over k rounded up. We'll call it the ceiling of n over k. This notation means you take the fraction n over k and you bump it up. If you can divide it, n, if k divides into n evenly, you're fine. But if k does not divide in any evenly, this extra pigeon has to go somewhere. Let's say you have um, 10 pigeons. Let's say you have 9 pigeons and 3 holes. You could put each of the 9 pigeons into 4 holes, into the 3 holes, right? So you could do 3, 3, 3. But what if you had 10 pigeons and 3 holes? You could do like three, three, four. So that hole doesn't get a third of a pigeon. It, that extra tenth pigeon has to go somewhere. So we'll put the tenth pigeon in a hole. So that's why you round up. N to the K, round up. Right? Questions on the generalized pigeonhole principle? We'll prove it, actually. This one we'll prove. It's going to take two seconds, two second proof. But do we believe it's true? Should be convinced. Yes? Um, what about the case where, like, say if there's like 10 pigeons, and like three holes, why can't you just say that there's like one pigeon in one hole and then nine in the other and one's empty? That would be possible. But consider every possible distribution that you could assign pigeons to holes, all of them. Two holes empty, ten pigeons in one hole. One pigeon, one pigeon, eight pigeons. One pigeon, two pigeons, seven pigeons, whatever. One pigeon, seven pigeons, two pigeons. Whatever way you can put the pigeons, one pigeon hole has to have more than the ceiling of n over k. So although you can argue about distribution and things like this, the pigeonhole principle, and now the generalized pigeonhole principle, is a precise statement. It's crafted by lawyers. So it is always true. You know, certain statements, versions of the pigeonhole principle like that, you may intuitively obviously say are true. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, if I were to put nine pigeons in one hole, then, then definitely nine is greater than 10, the ceiling of 10 over 3. But that's only true conditionally if you say something about the way that pigeons are assigned. And in certain problems, maybe there is a way pigeons are assigned. But that's not the true power of the pigeonhole principle, is it's that it doesn't come with that assumption. That's the, the power is that it doesn't matter. In, in, independent, the, it's formulated by a lawyer such that no matter how you assign the pigeons, it's still true. Right. Good question. Um, so let's prove it. Uh, suppose uh, that S has n elements. And you partition S uh, into disjoint subsets, S1, S2, Sk. You have n pigeons. You put them into k holes in such a way that uh, S1 through Sk are, are a partition. What that means is Si intersect Sj is uh, empty. right? They're a partition. We know the definition of a set partition. right? Uh, they split up the elements. No pigeon is in two holes at once. 
part of the pigeonhole principle, right? It's injection. Um, excuse me, or it is a function. Uh, assume to the contrary. Each SI uh, has uh, the size of SI is strictly less than uh, the ceiling of n to the k. Now, being strict, strictly less than the ceiling of n to the k, let me make sure I got this exact. Well, excuse me. Being strictly less than the ceiling of n to the k means you are less than or equal to the ceiling of n over k minus 1. Right? We changed the inequality, the, the strict inequality to an inequality. So if you're, but if you, if you know that you're, what do you know about the ceiling of n over k minus 1? Let's suppose, let's try and drop the ceiling. This, this is going to be n over k plus some remainder, which is rounded up to 1, right? But if we subtract off that remainder, we actually know an upper bound of this. What is it? Give me an upper bound of the ceiling of n over k minus 1. Right? If you have that half, the ceiling is going to round it up. But then you're subtracting 1. So what do you know is an upper bound of this? n over k, n over k unsealinged. So suppose each uh, si has less than n over k elements. Right? None of them are strictly greater than. Right? We know that s is equal to S1 union uh, S to the K, right? But then what's the cardinality of S? The cardinality of S is going to be the cardinality of S1 union SK, right? We may imply inclusion-exclusion. We have K elements. Thankfully, the inclusion-exclusion uh, is all uh, tr trivial here because we assume that each no pigeon is in two holes. So we don't get a complicated inclusion-exclusion. We may simply write this as what? Right? We know the size of each one is strictly less than n to the k, right? n over k. n over k, correct. Thank you. So we know that this is strictly less than n over k plus, plus n over k, right? But how many of those are there? So we know that the cardinality of s is strictly less than k times n over k, which is just equal to n. So we know that the cardinality of s is strictly less than n. Contradiction. The original principle is so simple, you may not have thought to even try to prove it, but it can be done. Right? If, you, if each pigeonhole had less than the required number of pigeons, when you add the pigeons back together, you're missing some. Contradiction. If you have n pigeons, the, the conditions of the pigeonhole principle are forced. Some pigeonhole has greater than or equal to n over, the ceiling of n over k pigeons in it. The largest pigeonhole has at least that many pigeons in it. Questions on the generalized pigeonhole principle? Um, it's a ceiling, ceiling notation that bumps up to the integer point. Oh. Exactly, yes. It is an integer function. It bumps it up. In fact, you may also see this. That bumps it down. That's called the floor and the ceiling, because the floor, ceiling, ceiling floor, right? So, uh, like if you had the ceiling of 10.7 is 11, you know, the ceiling of 11 is 11. Okay, has anyone ever bothered to count the number of hairs on their head? Anyone done the math on that one? 
oh, okay, I Googled it. The average number of hairs on someone's head is between 80,000 and 120,000, okay? I don't know about that stat, but that seems wrong. That seems like a lot, that seems too much, like too many hair. Um, let's suppose that this is an average statement, okay? Let's suppose no one has more than 200,000 hairs. Okay, there are some very hairy people, there are some outliers. But let's suppose the largest outlier has 200,000. That means that they are maybe 200% of the average, okay? That doesn't mean the out, there is not like, you know, wolf people outliers or something. But let's suppose and assume, and this is a, a conditional proof we're going to do, on the assumption that no one has more than 200,000 hairs, okay? Does anyone know the population of Atlanta? 500,000? I have actually, that's better than my, I was going to say 498,000 is the population of Atlanta. Okay. There's half a million. Now, what is Atlanta? It's, you know, people keep trying to break off parts of Atlanta from Atlanta. But let's suppose that there's 500,000 people in Atlanta, 498,000 people in Atlanta. Okay. Um, if there's only if the number of hairs on someone's head can range from a value of zero, bald people exist, to at most 200,000 wolf people, but on average it'll be somewhere between there, we don't need to talk about randomness or probability here if we know that the values must range between zero and 200,000. If there's half a million people in Atlanta, we know that there are two, uh, 498,000 divided by 200,000, which is equal to what? Someone do that math for me real quick. Three. Yeah, 2.49, let's bump it up. We're gonna get, that's, that's almost five, that's almost two. So that's two over five, is, it's gonna be 2.49. We bump it up, it's gonna be three. You're missing a zero. On that zero. Oh, no I'm not. 20, oh, 20,000, yes I am, you're right, so, thank you. Uh, 200,000, uh, so that there exists three, uh, there are three people in Atlanta with the same number of hair on their head. By the pigeonhole principle, we can assert that there are three people in Atlanta Three people in Atlanta are walking around and they don't even know it, that they have the same number of hairs on their head. Now, when you consider the data set a little closer, it's easy to find which people they are. I can find you three people that are bald. So that's sort of trivial, is sometimes the problem. Sometimes the pigeonhole, you can find what pigeonhole it is, okay? But the pigeonhole in general is not constructive. Even if we eliminate the bald population of Atlanta, can we do uh, an analysis? What percent of the population of Atlanta do you think is bald? Is it less than 50%? Okay, is it less than 10%? It's not less than 10%? Bald. You, what is it, what do we, guesstimate me a percentage of people that are bald. Five. 5% Five of people in the, in the population of Atlanta are bald. Let's subtract 5% of 498,000. We're still gonna round up the three, right? So there's still three people walking around with the same number of hairs on their head and they don't even know it. They may meet each other, they'll never even know. Crazy that that happens. And again, this is just, I keep repeating myself on this part, but this is just one of the powerful parts of the pigeonhole principle. These three people are willed into existence. They don't know anything about each other except that, we don't know anything about them except that they exist and that they're in Atlanta, right? And in fact, take this argument and increase the number of pigeons. Do you guys know the population of Georgia? Hmm? Yes. I have 10.7 million. Show you how few people live in Atlanta. You know, most people live in the greater Atlanta area, but not in Atlanta itself. Um, so if we do 10.7 million divide by 200,000, and we take the ceiling of that, what is that? Someone do the math for me on that one. Let's try get it exact. That's a good estimate. I got 54. But 
great you can do that in your head. There's 54 people in Georgia with the same number of hairs on their head. Right? They could all be friends. Who knows? But there's 54 of these people. And in fact, as the population increases, if you consider a larger group of people, you can consider a population in the United States, you know there has to be a larger set of people in, in this whatever set you're considering, your pigeons, that have to have the same number of hairs on their head. Right? Kind of a, a fascinating uh, thought. Again, I'll mention that there's a, this is a huge overestimate. 200,000 hairs on someone's head is a lot. Right? If the average is between 80 and 120, we may suppose that you know, two-thirds of people fall within that average anyway. But, we're, but by the pigeonhole principle, that's fine. We can still take a, like a, a nice upper bound, right? If, it could even be the case. It may be the case that no one has bothered to check, but that every single person in the state of Georgia has the exact same number of hairs on their head except those that are bald. That could be true, but we just no one has bothered to check it, right? Pigeonhole principle gives us that at least three people in Atlanta, though. Questions on this? Um, we can also say something else. What's the uh, uh, two people in uh, the world population have the same number of arms? You know, what is the average number of arms though? Less than two. Strictly less than two. Some person has no arms, and they bring the average below two. Right. Okay. Actually, we, what we would say is that the number of people with no arms and the number of people with one arms are less than the, the number of people with more than two arms. So therefore, the average must also be below two. We'll talk about randomness later. Suppose you have a program, and it spits out random numbers. How many must it spit out to get that uh, uh, 10 of these are in the same, the word is an equivalence class, but I'll say remainder, mod 6. So we have a program that's going to spit out for us numbers. 22, 375 million, uh, 365 million, 465,512, 0, 17. It's going to spit out us for random numbers in sequence. How many numbers must it spit out for us to ensure that, the, that 10 of the numbers, when you mod them, all fall into the same re remainder? Right? If we had seven numbers, we would guarantee that two numbers have the same remainder. Right? But we want to know how many numbers do we need to ensure that 10 of them have the same remainder. So we'll apply the generalized pigeonhole principle here. We have some number n we're looking for. Now, what are our pigeonholes? Yeah, so we're looking for this to be greater than or equal to 10, right? But we're also looking for the least n, right? the smallest n. So we would want uh, the ceiling of n minus 1 over 6 to be less than what? 10, right? So if you take off one less pigeon, you don't have the property. We want the smallest n to have this property, right? If the ceiling of n minus 1 over 6 is uh, less than, strictly less than 10, what do we know that n minus 1 over 6 must be less than or equal to? Right? Again, this is going to be only like that half and it's going to be rounded up or something, right? 9. Okay. Now, if we solve for n here, what do we get? Yes. S, n, n is less than or equal to, hold on, 6 times, 9 times 6 is what? 54. 54 plus 1 is 55, right? Um, actually, but it shouldn't be less than or equal to this one, for this one, right? If n is equal to this, 
we'll get n is equal to 54. Yeah, if you have n is equal to 50, if n is equal to 54, you can put 54 objects into six holes equally and not have a remainder, uh, have any of those six holes have 10 or more, right? But as soon as you hit 55, the, ten, the 55th pigeon goes into a hole that already has at least nine in there, in the worst case, right? So if you put 54 is too few pigeons because you can put nine in each of the six holes. Six times nine is going to be 54, right? But as soon as you have this plus one pigeon, in the worst case, this is the smallest value of n by the, gener by the generalized pigeonhole principle that allows us to fit in there. Right? Questions on this? Okay, let's just do one more uh, generalized pigeonhole problem. This is a great problem. This is like a, one of those ones that you can think about when you fall asleep. This is a famous problem as well. You guys heard of Ramsey theory? Ramsey theory is basically like the greatest application of uh, the generalized pigeonhole principle. It's basically asserting like um, under certain conditions, you, certain things must happen no matter what. As long as certain things are big enough, certain events must occur. Uh, among six people, each are mutual, each are, let's say, both, both friends, each, let's say, each pair are uh, both friends or both enemies. There exists a group of three mutual friends or three mutual enemies. So if you have six people and everyone either agrees, yeah, we're both friends, or everyone agrees, yeah, we're both enemies, there's no... Two people who were one people thinks they're friends and the other people thinks they're enemies. Among every group of six people, such that every three think every two of them, they're either both friends or they're both enemies, we may assert that six people is enough to conclude that there must exist a pair of three friends or three enemies. Right? Six is enough to will into existence this triplet that are all mutual friends or mutual enemies. Now, this is the original phrasing of the problem, but of course, we can delegate ourselves back to mathematical tools. You guys know what a graph is? Not like a plot of graph, but dots and lines. We may consider uh, drawing six dots and assigning them. Uh, do we have six people? Maybe they're sitting around a table. Let's draw an edge between every two of them. Okay, how many edges is that? Sixteen edges. Let's see. It's going to be five plus four plus three plus two plus one. Is it sixteen? Fifteen edges. Okay, fifteen edges. So we can consider all possible combinations of relationships that six people may have. What we can do is consider what's called a coloring of this object. This is called a graph. A graph is a collection of dots and lines. Okay? A graph is independent of the way you like draw it, right? It's just the relationships that the dots have to the lines, right? If we were to color every edge, let's say we color them F and E for friend and enemy. If we color them friend, friend, enemy, friend, 
enemy, friends, whatever, right? To each edge, assign a color, F or E, red or blue, right? What we're saying here, what is the equivalent uh, statement here? What does it mean for there to be a group of three friends or three enemies if we consider the graph problem instead of the friend problem? There is a subgraph of three points such that all three lines are either friends or enemies. What is the subgraph of three lines? Triangle. Right. Yeah. So in this graph, there is, no matter how you color it, red or blue, there always exists a red triangle or a blue triangle. Now suppose you try to color the whole graph red. Certainly there's just a red triangle. Suppose you try to color some edges blue. It turns out as you try to do that, if you color the whole graph blue, it also contains a blue triangle. But in between those two, as you try to color it, every coloring either has a red triangle or a blue triangle. We can prove this by the pigeonhole principle. But any questions on the problem statement first? So here's how the proof will uh, proceed. Uh, fix one person. Let's call them A without loss of generality. Consider their relationships. How many, there are, if you, there are six people and A is one person, A has relationships with how many other people? So A has relationships uh, to five other people, okay? A is either friends or enemies with all of them, right? What do we know by the generalized pigeonhole principle about the relationships that A has to these other people? There must be at least three uh, friends or enemies. It's relationship. Yes. By the generalized pigeonhole principle, A is friends or enemies with uh, the ceiling of five over two of these people. Now, what's the difference between red and blue? What's the difference between black and white? What's the difference between friend and enemy? It doesn't really matter, right? So without loss of generality, suppose A is friends with three of these people, with B, C, and D. And let's suppose we call those three people B, C, and D, OK? Now, it could be the case that A is enemies with those three people, whatever. But without less to generally, just suppose that they're that, right? So we have what A, we have A here. Oh, I already drew it. We have A here, okay? A is going to be friends with B. We'll put an F on the edge for friends. A is going to be friends, I'll do it here, with C. And A is going to be friends with D, right? So A is friends with three people. We know those three people exist. We don't actually know what their actual names are, but let's just suppose we call them B, C, and D. We know, though, that every group, every pair of people have a relationship. They're either both friends. Everyone is either both friends or both enemies. So in fact, B, C, and D also have a relationship. Right? But what is that relationship? Case one. B, C, and D are mutual enemies. Then the theorem is proven. If these three are mutual enemies, this is E, this is E, and this is E. If the three are mutual enemies, then that is a triangle colored E, right? This is a triangle that's colored the same. 
Now, when we break things up into the, into the cases, they must be total, right? Let me just redraw the whole picture. If uh, B, C, and D are mutual enemies is case one, case two would be the negation of that. What is the opposite of three people being mutual enemies? Sorry? Not that they're all mutual friends. Right. Yeah. At least one pair of BC, BD, or CD are friends. Then this pair plus A are a trio of friends. Either way, there exists three mutual friends or three mutual enemies. What that means here, if we go back to the coloring, let's say these two are friends, but these two are enemies. D is just, D just hates C and D for some reason, okay? A is then friends with B and C. And if B and C are friends, then ABC is a triangle. Now, if D and E were friends, then ADE would be the triangle. And if B and D were friends, then ABD would have been the, the, the triangle, right? By the pigeonhole principle, we know no matter how you color this graph, it must be the case that it always has a red triangle or a blue triangle. Now, this is actually a finite object. So you could break this into a number of cases and draw the coloring for each one. How many upper bound, how many cases would we have to prove if we were to draw as many colorings of this? How many edges are there again? How many colors are there? So how many cases are there? For each coloring, how many possible colorings are there? Yeah, if we don't count isomorphisms like rotating the graph, is that the same or not? Let's suppose we each edge is unique. We don't consider things like that. There are two to the 15 cases. How many is that? Someone do two to the 15 real quick for me. It's more than 1,000. 32,000. 32,000. So there's 30, you could do this proof by writing 32,000 cases. Case one, they're all red. It has a red triangle. Case two, they're all red except one edge. That definitely has a red triangle. And then each case would have subcases for where that edge is, right? So uh, don't do that, right? Again, the proof is about elegance. This is a pigeonhole principle, powerful tool. Great hammer to have, you know? We willed into existence the red triangle. And if the red triangle wasn't there, it was a, there, then the non-existence of the red triangle implied the existence of a blue triangle, QED. Right. Any questions? Pigeonhole principle? Excellent.